Another big year passed for The Chaser's War on Everything on ABC TV. And you're out in print form now as well, The Chaser Annual 2009. Craig, Julian, welcome to RM Breakfast. It's great to be here. here. Um, Julian, if I could begin with you, because on Friday night you had the honour of uh, giving the Andrew Ollie Memorial Lecture. You took a bit of a swipe at the ABC uh, in general, and when you're talking about <coughs> satire and comedy, you said the ABC shouldn't give in to short-term hysteria of media outrage. You were speaking in relation in particular to the Make a Realistic Wish Cancer mm, sketch that yeah. saw you guys banned for a couple of weeks from the ABC. Do you think that's what happened there in relation to that, that the uh, ABC did cave in to short-term hysteria? Yes. Um, no, I mean, there were a lot of factors that went that were involved in that decision. But um, uh, and, a lot and, of people in Australia who thought you guys deserved to be kicked off altogether. Yeah, sure, mm. sure. And um, we disagreed with them and we disagreed with them publicly. But, yeah, I, I think that what was happening was that there was a bit of uh, media hysteria, particularly whipped up in... Uh, talk back and the like, and I think that the ABC placed too much regard on people who aren't part of the target target audience. Uh, but I also said that I thought that I really welcomed the ABC decision because it gave us a two week break and it made it easier for us to make the show a couple of weeks later. Um, so um, now, of course, yeah. that's absolutely the sort of comment that makes some people just loathe you guys. Sure. Um, and in fact, in the speech, you also sort of withdrew the apology you delivered at the time. You, you targeted it more closely. You, you apologised again to those directly affected by childhood cancer, which means your original apology was disingenuous. What, no, to get you back on air? Uh, with due respect, Fran, that is completely correct. incorrect. Um, what I did was reiterate the apology in similar terms to the way that we issued it at the time. Uh, but then I also said that if you're just offended by something, I don't think that's a grounds for apologising to people. Uh, that's entirely consistent with everything that we've said. Um, and um, I think that the way that the media's interpreted it probably serves the media's ends more than um, accuracy of reporting. Well, the reality is we, we, uh, we do... We did not think we thought the sketch was a mistake, but there's a distinction between saying, "Okay, they got it wrong," and then backing a creative team or backing people and saying, mm. "Okay, they're going to get it right next time," and actually taking people off air because that sets a, a bit of a bad precedent for editorial decisions in the future and for other people who might be wanting to work on the ABC and expecting to get support from them, like John Safran or mm. uh, you know Chris Lilly or things like mm. that. So that's people second guessing themselves. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the argument actually of the lecture was that um, it's not the standard of the Australian community that when you talk about community standards that the only things that should be broadcast are things which are acceptable to everyone or even the majority that in fact you want a diverse culture where some things that aren't acceptable to a lot of people are broadcast and even occasionally that might mean that a lot of people are upset about it. I thought it was kind of interesting your theory about secondary outrage you dubbed it secondary yeah. outrage which in this media world where <laughs> things aren't broadcast once you know if you've mm. missed it you've missed it you can catch it on all sorts of platforms which you say just sort of um uh, emphasises and, and broadcasts at a higher volume anything that might be a little bit contentious. That's right. Um, I, I think I said that it, it creates a kind of uh, global media echo chamber. Um, what I was trying to say was that um, the primary audience of something, people who watch a show because... Uh, they want to, or just because they happen to be watching the TV at the time, is very different from people who only come to content because it's controversial, who might watch a sketch of ours which is available on the News Limited website or the 2GB website because somebody on that platform has said, you have to watch this, it's outrageous. I think that's a distinction which needs to be uh, observed pretty closely. And I also think it's one that... Um, uh, regulators, including the ABC with its in its self-regulation, need to attend to because sometimes you're worrying about the wrong people. Yeah, though just because something is a, what you might call a secondary outrage, you've been pointed towards it and then you get outraged, mm. doesn't mean it's not valid. I mean, there's a, a story in the yep. news about uh, uh, St Paul's, some students at St Paul's College who had a Facebook mm. um, page about uh, pro-rate Facebook page it's described as. It's not there anymore, so mm. if you haven't seen it, you hadn't seen it. But mm. it doesn't mean that perhaps people shouldn't be outraged at this notion. No, I, look, I, I agree. And I never said that you should completely ignore the views of the secondary audience, but I think that uh, the secondary audience has a kind of amplifying and distorting effect uh, often and can misrepresent the overall view of what I've called the fair-minded mainstream of the Australian media. I'd like to dedicate this song to you, Gramps. He was very hard of hearing, he was dull and domineering, misogynist, cantankerous and vain. He hit the bottle every night, he hit my grandma out of spite, and those stories about his bunions were a pain. But all that's now forgotten, once he took his final breath, 
Yes, even pricks turn into top blokes after death. You can also, because people don't necessarily see something in context. So, for instance, the, the eulogy song was an example of where something was went to air and there were almost no complaints after it went to air because people saw it within the context of the show and understood where it was coming from. And then people were played small bits of it on the radio and suddenly there was an enormous amount of complaints made and they didn't understand the... Con they didn't see the, hear the introduction, they didn't understand the context of it. So you just got to see something, you know... And a creative light like that has to be seen in context, I think, before it can be judged. OK, let's go to the annual, because you guys, of course, started out as a newspaper. The Chaser Annual, 2009. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of the, the best spoof news articles from the Chaser website, or how you've judged it anyway. <laughs> and uh, a most a noteworthy event of the last 12 months occurred pretty much 12 months ago when the uh, US President Barack Obama was elected. Mm. Your headline in the Chaser Annual said, Obama's victory was George Bush's greatest achievement. Well, it's true. It's true. I mean, only really after following a, a president as bad as George Bush could you actually get a black man elected in America. So that was an incredible achievement for George Bush. And, and we I thought think... it was a beautiful tribute to George Bush that uh, Barack Obama completely mangled the oath of office as a tribute to mm. George Bush's use of the English language. It was lovely. And how do you rate uh, President Obama's performance so far? Have you been keeping tabs on that? I think without doubt he's been the best black president America's ever had. I think he is. Yeah. I think he has. Look, I'd like to give him a Nobel Prize for health care because he hasn't <laughs> achieved that yet either. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to give you a Nobel Peace Prize for everything before he achieves. It's like an encouragement award. I like the way the Nobel Peace Prize is now given out to encourage people to go in that direction rather than having actually achieved it. I yeah, that's right. We should get a taste award this yeah, year on should, the same yeah, grounds. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 2009 is the Chinese year of the ox, but really for many of us it was a year of the swine, swine flu to be precise. And you've prepared, and in this annual it's here, a pandemic beat-up survival guide. What are your tips? Look, yeah, the, the main thing to avoid a pandemic beat up is to avoid uh, any touch with journalists. That's yes. important. Uh, constantly wash your hands all the time. And the reason for that is that in, when you're washing your hands, you can't read news limited newspapers. And that just keeps you away from the beat up. Absolutely. And also, it's very important to cough uh, with etiquette. Um, if people are talking about the swine flu, you should cough on them incessantly mm. until they go away and stop talking about so it. Cough yeah. over them. Absolutely. You cough over them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that way you are. And if, you, if at any time you actually think you might have caught the pandemic fear, just stay in your house and don't call Talkback Radio. That's the main thing. <laughs> don't touch that dial. Don't touch that telephone. Yeah. Um, a huge event this year, a huge news event, the dominant news event, the global financial crisis. Uh, in Australia, we got Kevin Rudd's cash stimulus handouts, the mm. check, the $900 checks. This is one of my favourite articles. <laughs> you managed to find out how some very famous people spent their $900. Well, that's right, friend. People say that the chaser doesn't do research, but mm. we, we rang around. We asked people what they were doing with their $900. We asked the Prime Minister himself, um, and he spent the $900 uh, buying flowers for all the staff that he'd, he'd abused that day. Yes. The $900 covered most of that. Yes, we, we spoke to Malcolm Turnbull. Malcolm Turnbull put it with his other loose change. That's right. Just chucked yeah. it in the change jar there. And Jamie Packer, very uh, inventively, uh, he used his $900 to invest in $400. That's a good return for that's him. A, that's a bit of a record. One of his better deals of, yeah, of the year. It really is. And Stern, who's funny too, he bought three <laughs> mid-level Chinese bureaucrats. Yeah. Yeah. We were kind of yeah. assuming that if you're in prison in Beijing, you wouldn't be able to sue for defamation. <laughs> mm. yeah, we also... We also Think. We thought, well, will the Chinese government use this as evidence against Stern? And we go, well, of course, Probably. as if they're going to use any evidence. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we stress, this is satire. Yes. And in federal politics, it was also the year of Godwin Gretsch and the email. In mm. fact, the Chaser Annual is uh, titled for this event. It's called the Email Eunuch. Yes. And it has a photo of Malcolm Turnbull in a very famous pose. That whole event was almost beyond satire. It was so bizarre in itself. Well, look, I mean, we we kind of were surprised that it became such a big story because when a, a guy whose name, Godwin Gretsch, sounds fake, it's probably not that surprising that every, every other bit of correspondence that he sent to the uh, to the opposition is. But it's it, it was um, an incredible uh, few days. In particular, my favourite moment was uh, Malcolm Turnbull calling for, I think, everyone in the Australian Parliament to resign. Yeah, yeah, that was a, uh, that was a highlight. Uh, <laughs> primarily because I think that's the only way he thinks he can beat Kevin Rudd is if Rudd just resigns. Exactly. I think in the end, though, of course, it turned out that the real author of this whole saga was J.K. Rowling and that uh, Goldwyn Gresh is just another Harry Potter character. I mean, <laughs> he, the, the, the day we saw him... And you saw Godwin Grace, you thought, this is ridiculous. This yeah, is yeah. this has got to be made up by somebody. That's right. But the chaser scoop was to actually find out that, in fact, uh, Godwin Gretsch got thousands of supportive emails, although they were all authored by him and sent into his own inbox. I think the one real uh, email he got was from the Federal Police. All right, guys. Now, 2010, you're still going. 
I yeah, think. A lot of people. Yeah. I'm not sure how many people how people will react to that news, but what's ahead for the Chaser in 2010? We don't know. We're gonna we're gonna do a, a drama series of Julian's Ollie lecture. Uh, just <laughs> yes. really tell the backstory behind it. <laughs> no, we don't know what we're gonna do, Fran. Um, we're gonna yeah. spend a bit of time coming up with a new format, um, mm. and exactly how long that takes uh, is something Depends that on may how not many be platforms answered. You try That's to right. Yeah. It may not be answered in 2010. Okay. All right, Craig Rucastle and Julian Morrow. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks. Man.